Roger Rush is our speaker for this hour, and I asked Roger, is there anything you want me to say before you speak? And he said, shorter is better, and I'm about as short as they come. So uh, we're certainly glad to have Roger with us today. Uh, uh, he's married. He has two kids, two grand, uh, grandchildren, and uh, he's been preaching since 1985 uh, with the 6th and Washington congregation in Marietta, Ohio. And uh, just every time I hear Roger, I know we're going to get the, the direct plain teachings of scripture and I always appreciate that and the way he does it so I will keep it short and let him speak to us this hour. Roger. I appreciate the introduction Jack more than you can imagine. Uh, when I submitted the manuscript for this lecture I immediately got a response first one in and there's a reason why I try to be the first one in, because it will need the greatest work afterward. And I appreciate Jack and his wife for the excellent job they do editing uh, the lectureship book. And I looked at uh, the results of their work when they emailed it back and uh, didn't realize how much work they had to do. So I am sincerely appreciative of what you do. I'm grateful for this school, I'm grateful for the eldership here, and for Andy and the work that he does, and all of those who labor in educating and training preachers, because we desperately need sound men in the pulpit proclaiming the most powerful message in the world. And the gospel is the most powerful force at work today, and I hope and pray we never, never lose sight of that. Thank you for the privilege of being in your presence and the opportunity to share from God's holy word. My assignment at this hour is Psalm 21. In Luke's fourth chapter, around verse 16 through approximately verse 20, Luke tells us that Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth and on the Sabbath as he typically did, he went to the synagogue. They handed him the scroll. He unrolled it to the place he desired to read and then publicly read and expounded on the Word of God. It seems to me that that's a good pattern to follow. And so we're going to share the reading of the text together this morning before we look at the message. But I want you to indulge me. I don't think that I can adequately deal with chapter 21 or Psalm 21 without first noting Psalm 20. And I know that this text has already been discussed earlier this week. And I'm certainly not in any way suggesting that that message was uh, in any way deficient. I'm merely acknowledging that for me to do what I have been assigned to do this morning, it is imperative that we look at these two psalms together. They're not terribly lengthy, so if you would bear with me as we go through the reading of God's holy word. We'll do this section by section so that you can appreciate what the author David is seeking to accomplish. May I suggest to you at the outset in Psalm 20, verses 1 through 5, there is a call for assistance, in essence a prayer for help. It is followed in verse 6 by, or rather verses, uh, yeah, verse 6 with uh, the confidence that men have in the aid of God when they call to Him. Verses 7 and 8 offer a contrast in attitudes, and, and then verse 9 a conclusion. So we'll do, verse, we'll do Psalm 20 and then Psalm 21. Here are the words of the psalmist. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. 
This is a prayer that, in my judgment, we should continue to pray. How can we possibly go wrong when we seek God's help in all of life's endeavors? Verse 6, then, confidence of aid. Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. I want to stop for a moment and highlight the word no. He doesn't say, I believe, I think, I feel. It's my personal expectation. He says, I know. He speaks with confidence, assurance, and clarity. There is no doubt. Nor should there be when we come into the presence of our God. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Now the contrast and attitude. I want you to see this in the framework of how it is to be understood. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. They have bowed down and fallen. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. But we have risen and stand upright. You see the outcome determined by the attitude going into the problem. In this case, it is my judgment that David and Israel are about to embark upon battle. How is victory to be achieved? The response is through the work of God. And the trust in God not to disappoint, but in fact to defend His people. Now I realize that the Israel of today is not the Israel of David's day. Israel is the church of our Lord and Savior, Galatians 6.16. But the confidence expressed in these words about God's relationship with Israel expresses the same confidence that we should have as spiritual Israel today, the church. And what is the source of this confidence? The answer, save Lord, may the King answer us when we call. The source of salvation, deliverance, and victory always comes from above. It seems to me wise that before engaging in battle, such a plea for assistance would fall on the lips of God's people. And aid, divine aid for their leader would clearly be sought. But seeking such aid implies confidence that prayers will be heard and answered. And when answered, what should be our response? I know by personal experience and by ministry over many, many years that we are good at asking God's help. And I know that God is great in providing it. But I wonder, I seriously wonder, if we take time to thank Him for His help and assistance the way we should. And that's why Psalm 21 follows. The king has achieved victory. The prayers of the people have been answered. God has not disappointed His own. Time now to thank Him for His aid. Which leads me to the psalm I have been assigned this morning, Psalm 21. The first section asserts that God answers, and He does. There is not a prayer that we pray that is not heard in heaven, and not a prayer that we pray that is not answered from above. Now, it is true that the answer we seek and the answer that we receive may not be the same, but never forget and Steve touched on this in the previous message when he dealt with providence, that God always knows best. And He works according to His schedule and not ours. And if the answer we get is not the answer we sought, the answer we get is the right answer. And we sought the wrong outcome. So when we cry out, 
God hears and answers verses 1 through 6. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. You've given him his heart's desire. You have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. For you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. They prayed, God answered, and blessings flowed forth. Never forget the source of those blessings. The king led Israel in battle against the enemy. The enemy was defeated. All is well with the kingdom. But it's not the king that deserves the glory. It is God. To him be the glory, honor, and praise. And how is it possible God answers the pleas or prayers of his people and the king acts in accordance with the divine will? Note verse 7, for the kings, for the king trust in the Lord and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. In order for success to be achieved, and the answer sought given from above, the king has to act properly. And how does he act? He trusts in the Lord. Some would say that there is no action in faith. I beg to differ. Where there is genuine faith, there is invariably action that validates that faith. Just as when there is love, there will be action that validates that love. You only need to read a couple of chapters and just a few verses in each to underscore this. John 14, three times Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. Verse 15 through verse 23. And in the epistle of James, James wrote in chapter 2 that if you claim you have faith but do not act, you have faith like the demons. It is dead and does not save. Where faith is alive it will always be evidenced by acts that validate that faith. Trust and obey are inseparably linked. The king trusts in God. He realizes that victory is his not because of his brilliance as a leader, not because his army is greater and better equipped, but because God is with him and he acts in behest of the Almighty. How we need to learn that lesson today. And like King David, trust in the Lord for the victory that is assured. It is said of the saints, we walk by faith, not by sight. But do we? How many of you are concerned about your future and retirement do I have enough set aside? How will I live when I've ceased to work? Now, I in no way would discourage you from saving and preparing for the future, but don't you know that God takes care of His own? And when we trust in Him, we will not be disappointed. The psalmist wrote in the 37th Psalm, the 25th verse, I've been young. I'm old. One thing I have not seen, the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God will not disappoint, but we must trust in him, trust and obey, live by his principles, follow his directives, be guided by his word. And then... Victory is assured. And that's really the remainder of this beautiful psalm. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. And the Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath. 
and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. For they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string toward their face. I see this as the psalmist saying, Our trust in God leads us to plant our feet firmly, face the enemy head on, and not give one inch. Not because we have confidence in ourselves, but because we have confidence in Him. And they will turn their back, and they will run. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. To God be the glory and the honor. God gives us victory. And the psalmist understood that and acted accordingly. We're not engaged in carnal warfare today. But we are in a battle. It is a battle for the souls of men. And I see so much discouragement and despair on the faces of my brethren today, up and down this valley, in congregation after congregation, with rare exception, numbers are dropping, and congregations are, old, are aging, and brethren are asking, what does the future hold? Whatever God wants. And I have no doubt that His church will survive. And someday thrive again if we cease putting confidence in ourselves and trust in Him as He calls us to do. In Revelation 4 and 5, John was permitted to look through an open door into heaven. He saw through that open door God seated on His throne with an emerald rainbow around. Twenty-four elders sat upon little thrones around the throne of God. Four living creatures are present. And in the right hand of God is a scroll sealed with seven seals. And the question is raised, who is worthy to remove the scroll and break the seals and thus reveal the content? And there was no one in heaven nor on earth, nor under the earth. And it brought John to tears. But in that moment of great despair, the voice was heard, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And John said, I looked again, and I did not see a lion, but a lamb. A lamb, as it were, slain for the sins of the people. Worthy is the lamb to remove the scroll, break the seals, and reveal the content. What was the message of that throw scene? The answer, to me at least, is obvious. What no one on earth, in heaven, or under the earth, and I assume that that encompasses everywhere known to man, there was no one with that kind of power, in that kind of position, to reveal a pertinent, powerful message for God's people. But what no one else could do, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, could do. And in chapter 6 and thereafter, the seals are broken and the message of God unfolds. Do you know what that message is? Some would say the message is, we win. But I believe the message is, we win in Him. In chapter 14, a beautiful scene of the redeemed is described in the presence of God. And in verse 4, this statement is found. These are they who follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. When you look at the language of the New Testament... It is the language of victory, not defeat. Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 
Thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. He causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. I have always wanted to be on the winning team, haven't you? I can remember as a youngster when we chose teams at recess and at lunchtime, I always knew what team I wanted to be on. I had a pretty good inkling of who was going to come out on top, and it's great to win. It's not much fun to lose. And yes, in most things, it's not win or lose, but how you play the game that really matters. But in the matter that matters most, folks, we always want to be on the winning side. And for that to happen, we have to stand with Jesus. We have to trust in God. Trust and obey to achieve the victory that King David and Israel achieved. But it doesn't stop there. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. I'll tell you up front, I on my own am not much. But God and I can do anything. I like what, they, what Jonathan said over there in 1 Samuel 14.6. He turned to his armor bearer and he said, I am persuaded with the Lord there is no restraint to say by many or by few. Let us arise and enter into the garrison of the Philistines. And Jonathan and his armor bearer took on the garrison and whipped them. Not because, again, they're better trained, better equipped, but because God was with them. I see all kinds of obstacles in our path as people of God today. I see all kinds of battles in this spiritual warfare that we're waging that we're going to have to wage but I'm not despondent. I'm not discouraged. I am not in despair because with God I know that victory is achievable and ultimately in Him we do win. Through Jesus we can do all things. As John wrote in his first epistle, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, some of our setbacks, some of our defeats, our own fault because he really isn't in us as he ought to be. I think one of the most discouraging experiences I've had as a gospel preacher has been those times, and sadly they have been many, when men and women that I respected, that I regarded as faithful saints in the service of the Lord, disappointed me by being anything other than what they professed to be. And if that's a disappointment to me, how much more so must it be to Him? I believe we fail in our congregations. We fail in our communities. We fail in our families, not because we don't have the right message, but often because we don't live what we advocate. We're not salt and light in a world that desperately calls for both. And until we become what God wants us to be, He can't work through us to accomplish His purpose and assure victory. But all of that can be changed. Every one of us can leave this place today determined to do better, to try harder, to let our light shine brighter, knowing that the power of God works through us to the glory of God. And with Him at our side, we truly are an invincible force, bringing men and women to the Master. Never, never, never doubt the power of God at work in the lives of His people. Let me refresh your memory, please, for a moment. Will you indulge me with some great assertions from Scripture? Steve, in the previous message, touched on Abraham and Sarah and the promised child Isaac. You know, I can't imagine being 100 years old and a new father. I am exhausted when I spend a day with my grandchildren. I just don't have the energy I had a few years ago. Imagine being aged Abraham and his beautiful bride of 90 years old now. 
having a son. It just does not seem possible. And yet Genesis 18, 14 raises the question, is anything too hard for God? You look at the direction this nation has taken just in the last two or three decades and you ask, can we turn things around? Will it get better? Well, yes, when we trust in Him and are guided by His Word because nothing is too hard for our Maker in the wilderness in Numbers 11. There's a fascinating account of the interaction between Israel and Moses. What a disheartening day that must have been. The nation says, in essence, to Mo Moses, we wish we were back in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, and yet out in the wilderness they're saying, oh, if we could only be back there. You know why? There we had meat, we had leeks and onions and cucumbers and melons to eat. And out here all we have is this light bread, this manna. We want meat! What a heartbreak that was to Moses and even more so to the Almighty. God said, all right, Moses, we'll give them meat till they won't want it. We'll fill their bellies. We'll send it in overflowing proportions. And Moses' response was, you mean we're going to have to kill all the cattle and catch all the fish of the sea? Moses just thought, that's not possible, Lord. Out here in the wilderness, we're going to provide all of that meat for them? How can that be? The Lord asked Moses, chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, is the Lord's hand waxed short or is the Lord's power limited? The answer was no. And you know the story. God sent them quail. I, I don't think I've ever eaten quail. I don't really ever intend to. It looks like a lot more work than I want to put in. I'd rather, I'd rather have turkey than quail any day of the week. Just a lot more to a, a turkey than a quail. But he sent it until it just overflowed. Moses doubted. But God's power should never be doubted. Now let me pause for a moment and, and touch on something. When we think about the, the characteristics of God, the omniscience, the omnipotence, the omnipresent, eternal, immutable, spiritual being who is our creator and sustainer, the uncaused first cause. He is all-powerful. And when you make a statement like that, somebody always wants to stop and say, well, can he make a rock so big that he cannot lift it? Or can he, because he can do anything, make a square circle? When people ask me questions like this, I immediately know they're not interested in truth. They're interested in denying it. Folks, when we say that God is omnipotent, all that we're saying is that anything that power can accomplish, God can do. But by definition, a square circle is impossible. And yes, even the omnipotent God cannot lie. He cannot be tempted. He does not tempt us. But where power can act, His power is unlimited. Our failing is in our failure to trust in that power, to believe that He really is in charge. And the desirable outcome is the attainable outcome when we trust in Him. Job asserted in Job chapter 42, verse 2, I know that you can do all things. My dearest friend on earth was recently diagnosed with ALS. I pray for him every day. I pray that God will heal him. I pray more importantly that God will aid those who are seeking to discover a cure for that disease so that he and everybody else who is afflicted might be made well. And I know God can do that. Whether he does or doesn't, 
remains to be seen. In His providence, He always does what is right. But I don't doubt His power. Like Job, I know that He can do all things. Jeremiah said, there's nothing too hard for the Lord, Jeremiah 32, 17. Jesus, commenting on the dangers of wealth and covetousness, said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And the disciples were beside themselves. Well, there really isn't any hope for anyone then. But what did Jesus say? Matthew 19, 26. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Somebody asked me how could God do it. I don't know. I suppose he could stick that camel in a big blender, liquefy him, pour him through the eye of the needle, and put him all back together when he's done. That's how much confidence I have in the power of God. That's the confidence that Jesus expressed. Some would say, well, he's not literally talking about the eye of a needle. This is an entrance into the city that was small that camels had to get down on their knees to. That's just complete nonsense. They said, this is impossible. And Jesus said, not with God. Never forget that. God gives victory to his people. Mary at the birth of Jesus, Luke 1, 37. For with God, nothing is impossible. Yes, a virgin bore a son. The birth of Jesus was like this, Matthew wrote. Joseph discovered that Mary was with child before they were married. Now, I know that Joseph knew he was not the father. I also know that he did not know who the father was. But he's a just man, and this is really important, folks. A just man is not going to make a public spectacle. He's not going to intentionally embarrass and humiliate this woman. While he thought on these things, he's going to put her away privately. And while he thought about it, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. He shall be called Jesus, for he, saves, he shall save his people from their sins. And then Matthew goes on to say that this is what the prophet had predicted, that a virgin should bring forth a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And Joseph, being raised with sleep from sleep, took into his wife Mary and knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son. You see, Joseph understood that with God, all things are possible. One time, a virgin was with child and bore the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Savior of humanity, the greatest demonstration of God's power and our ultimate victory we will ever encounter. No wonder the psalmist asserts to God be the glory. In Romans chapter 11, Paul wrote, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, and who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and to him it shall be recompensed again. Of him, through him, to him be all things, the glory in all things, forever and ever. Amen. Thank God every day for the victory you have in Jesus Christ. Live your life in confidence, knowing full well when you seek first the kingdom and righteousness, everything you need, He will provide. In that beautiful story in, in Matthew 6, as Jesus addresses the audience on the mountaintop, He says, you see the lilies of the field, how they grow, Solomon in all His glory was not arrayed like one of these, and you see the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store up, but your heavenly Father feeds them. If God clothes the lilies and feeds the birds, don't you think He will take care of you? Did you know that there are approximately 100 billion birds in our world? 
Now, I did not count, but I have read that ornithologists who have counted have concluded that this is the approximate number, and it remains essentially steady. A hundred billion birds, and God takes care of them. I stop and remind you, he doesn't throw the seed in the nest or drop the worm in the mouth, but he provides. Jesus says if he takes care of the birds of the air, how much more so will he take care of us? If we seek first the kingdom and righteousness, all these things shall be added to us. Victory will be ours, not because of our greatness, not because of our righteousness, not because of our sinlessness, but because of his. So that we can live with confidence, assurance, and certainty of victory. Victory in the Lord. In another psalm, the 118th psalm, to be precise, verses 8 and 9, the psalmist said, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. You know, people will disappoint us. Sadly, I know I have disappointed others, never to my knowledge intentionally, but I know I have. God, on the other hand, will never disappoint. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Don't count on the government or you're going to be greatly disappointed. Don't count on people. You're going to be disappointed again. Count on God, and you will indeed be victorious, both here and hereafter. I wish there were a way that I could impress that on the minds of everyone, and in particular, those who are young in years, that the way to a full, meaningful, productive, and eternal life is to trust and obey. To give your heart, soul, mind, body, strength in the service of the King of Kings. And know that when you do, in the end, victory will be yours. And yes, there will be defeats along the way. The prosperity gospel originates with Satan, not the Savior. The Lord doesn't promise that your problems will be solved, that your obstacles will be removed, that your path will be easy. Just the opposite. Because He is always honest in His assessments. I came not to bring peace, but a sword, He said. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Do you share in that reward? Are you trusting and obeying Jesus? We're going to sing a song in just a moment, a song designed to provide opportunity for any in our assembly who are not yet experiencing the victory that comes to believers in Christ. But there are conditions that have to be met before the blessings are ours. Faith from the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, must be demonstrated in repentance, Luke 13, 3 and 5. In confession, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And yes, in immersion, that's what baptism is, where the old man is buried, and a new man is raised to walk in newness of life with our future secured and heaven assured, not because of us, but because of him. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If you know that, your life is filled with meaning and purpose, and you are one of God's successful creatures doesn't matter how much money you make, what position you fill, what power you wield. If you leave the Lord out of your life, you are a miserable failure, and it need not be. You can know victory in Jesus Christ if you'll act on His demands. We'll be here at the front of the building. Someone will take your confession and gladly immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. And you can know that Jesus will wash those sins away with his blood. He will add you to his church, and he will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And maybe you've done all of those things, but you've lost your way. Now let me tell you, if there's something personal and private that stands between you and your Maker, take care of that privately. 
we don't need to hear about it. If there's a problem between you and your neighbor or your mate, we don't need to hear about that either. Genuinely, get on your knees and say, I'm sorry, forgive me, I was wrong. But if there's something amiss in your life that is open to public folks, say with Simon, pray for me. And God has promised to hear and forgive. He's pulling for us more than anything else. He wants us in His presence eternally. He sent His Son to prove it. Jesus came and went to Calvary because of His love for us. And more than anything else, they want us with them eternally. And if we are not, we will have no one to blame but ourselves. Don't let that happen. You will regret it forever and ever. But obey Him and live for Him while you can the victorious life that comes to God's people. Thank you again for listening patiently. And if you're subject to His call, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Wow.